OK, TLA plus viewed from. Uh, I'm viewing it from 40,000 feet. Uh, oh, this is not the correct talk and uh, the correct title. And actually, Marcus is viewing it from uh, ground level. Uh, now, start by some quotations from our chairman. <coughs> he said the quality of our products is paramount. We need to reflect on how we can get better on this. I want our field leadership to know that we are very focused on quality and we're not happy when we don't deliver. You should think about the quality you're impacting and really take pride in your craft. We need to rekindle the passion that engineers have for their craft. So that's what he wrote. Quality, pride, and passion. Now, uh, somebody has their mic not muted. <laughs> uh, idealistic for practical managers and engineers. Well, our CEO is practical and he's a manager and at least he used to be an engineer. So what is Microsoft passionate about? Testing, very passionate about testing. Now for sequential programs, Extensive testing can produce software with a small enough number of bugs. But is small enough number of bugs the kind of quality craftsmanship we should be proud of? Marcus is going to talk about that a little later. For concurrent or distributed systems, testing simply can't find all the critical bugs. Uh, an example, <clears throat> the Xbox 360, that was quite a few years ago. I, uh, now, IBM built the chip uh, for that, uh, for the Xbox, and a Microsoft research intern wrote a TLA plus spec of its cache coherence protocol, which led him to find a subtle bug. Now, IBM said that their tests would not have found that bug, and they would have shipped us chips that deadlocked after four hours of use, and Microsoft would probably have missed the Christmas launch because of that, losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, I could give other success stories. Uh, for example, uh, there's Cosmos DB, which made extensive use of TLA+. Uh, but I'm just going to describe one uh, from our solar system. Uh, that story begins with Virtuoso, which was a real-time operating system that flew on the Rosetta spacecraft uh, and European Space Agency spacecraft that went to an asteroid. And the people who built uh, Virtuoso, when they built their next version of, of the operating system, uh, they wrote a book about it, that before writing any code, they wrote a complete TLA plus spec of the design. Now, that was passion. And here's what their project leader wrote to me. He said that the TLA plus abstraction helped a lot in coming to a much cleaner architecture. And one of the results was that the code size is 10 times less than in the earlier version. Actually, I li recently looked at the book and that said five to 10 times. So I don't know which number to believe, but a pretty big reduction in code size. Algorithms. Now, it's been uh, about 50 years since I actually designed a real concurrent system. And in recent decades, what I've been doing is developing concurrent algorithms. So I'm going to talk about algorithms. Now, why should Microsoft care about algorithms? We build software. We don't write algorithms. Well, what is an algorithm? An algorithm is a high level design of a program or of a programming task. Now, the algorithms that are generally called algorithms, you find them in books and journals, and they're there because that programming task is, first of all, not trivial to solve, and second of all, can be used in many programs. For example, sorting, uh, a nice programming task. Now, the programming tasks that Microsoft designs or uses are 
often not trivial to solve, but they seldom are used in many programs. They're one offs. So engineers don't think they have to write algorithms and they're wrong. So exactly what is an algorithm? Is it a piece of code? No, it's not a piece of code. Code is a particular implementation of an algorithm. An algorithm is a higher level abstraction or an architecture. It's an idea, basically. Now, an idea has to be written down. First, to communicate it to somebody else. And secondly, to know if it makes sense. One of my favorite cartoons is this, which by the cartoonist uh, Grindon, which if you can't read the small print says, uh, writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. So you write something down, until you write an idea down, you only think you have an idea. So how do we write it down? Well, let's try English. So I'll describe Euclid's algorithm, not because Euclid's algorithm is terribly interesting, and actually it is, but it's the simplest algorithm I know, uh, pretty much. So Euclid's algorithm in English, it computes the GCD, the greatest common divisor of positive integers, M and N, as follows. Now, the, greatest, the GCD of M and N is the largest number that divides both M and N. So here's the algorithm. It initializes X, two variables, X and Y, initializes X to M and Y to N. And it keeps subtracting the smaller of X and Y from the larger. And it stops when X equals Y. And at that point, X and Y both equal the GCD of M and N. It's really a beautiful algorithm, but I'm not going to say much about the algorithm, but about how we describe it. So here's Euclid's algorithm in English. Well, actually, these other parts are the properties of the algorithm, what it does and you know what's true of it when it, when it stops, but they're not part of the algorithm. So we can ignore those for now. Uh, now, English is, is pretty nice. It's simple if you speak English. There's no extraneous stuff in this description, but English has problems. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it doesn't scale well. A large bunch of English is pretty hard to make sense of. And it can be ambiguous. A little story. Now, Paxos is a distrib distributed algorithm that I wrote. And it's used in many fault tolerant systems running on local area networks. Uh, and it's been implemented a few times inside of Microsoft systems. Now, I wrote a rigorous description and proof, but I later, but people complained that that was you know, hard to understand. So I later wrote a little document called Paxos Made Simple, which described Paxos in English. And now I'm very good at writing clear and precise prose, but a couple of years ago, an engineer told me that this paper has one ambiguous sentence and interpreting it the wrong way leads to a bug in the algorithm. And he examined a bunch of open source implementations of Paxos, and he said that several of them have that bug. So that bug was introduced because people read the English rather than the rigorous description that I had written. So English can be ambiguous. And it's you can be sloppy in English. And sloppy writing can hide sloppy thinking. Well, what about programming languages? They're complicated. Uh, there's a book I found on the web uh, called The Semantics of Java in only 381 pages. Uh, that's complicated. And programming languages have lots of extraneous stuff. And for good reason, because they have to be translated into efficient machine code. So what should we use instead? So English has problems. Uh, now, my modification of Gwyndon's cartoon is that math is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your writing is. So English is pretty nice. 
But math is very nice. It's simple, if you know a little simple math. There's no extraneous stuff. And it's been refined over many centuries by many very smart people. So it's a really cool language. So write Euclid's algorithm in math. Start with initialization. Initially, x equals m and y equals n. Well, that looks like math, except that and is English, not math. Well, mathematicians have a way of writing uh, and in math. They use this symbol. Now, do not freak out. Most computer people do when they see this funny symbol. They're afraid of math. Believe me, they are. But this is Microsoft. We don't let a little math stop us, do we? And this is really simple math. It, and this is just a funny symbol for and. Just get used to it. Now, keep subtracting the smaller of X and Y from the larger. Keep subtracting. Programs tell a computer what to do. Keep subtracting. Math says what's true if you do it. So what's true if you subtract, but what is subtracting the smaller of X and Y from the larger make true? <clears throat> we can describe this with math as a relation between the current and the next values of X and Y. So let's write the current values of X and Y as X cur and Y cur. And let's write the next values of X and Y as x next and y next. So subtracting the smaller of x and y from the larger. Well, there are two possibilities. One is that x cur is less than y cur. x is smaller than y in the current value. And the next value of y is what you get by subtracting the current value of x from the current value of y. It's equal to y cur minus x cur. Or the other possibility, y cur is less than x cur, and the next value of x is its current value minus the current value of y. OK, now we know how to put and in, in math. It's this funny symbol. And or also has a funny symbol. It's the and symbol written upside down. So uh, this is, is perfectly nice, but you know, if we start getting things a little bit more complicated, those subscripts are going to get really annoying. So I'm just going to replace X cur and Y cur, but just by X and Y. So X and Y refer to the current values. And I'll replace X next and X and Y next by X prime and Y prime. So the prime variables refer to their next values. So this is sub subtracting the smaller of X and Y from the larger described in math. Well, what's wrong with this? Uh, I usually ask a show of hands, and generally the only people who raise their hands are people who have actually used TLA, TLA+. Plus. If I say that the Mariners and Astros are in Seattle today, and the Mariners will be in LA tomorrow, does that mean that the Astros will still be in Seattle tomorrow? No, it doesn't say anything about where the Astros are going to be tomorrow. So this formula doesn't say anything about what the next value of x is. Well, we need to say that. And the next value of x is just equal to the current value of x, because implicit in the English is that we're not changing x. And the uh, second possibility. So this is the actual math that describes subtracting the smaller of x and y from the larger. And so here's Euclid's algorithm in math. Now, what this second part is, is it the first part describes the initial values of X and Y, and the second part describes how X and Y are allowed to change. Now, what about this part? Stop when X equals Y. Well, we don't need to say that. Why? Well, what? how can X and Y change when X equals Y? Well, when X equals Y, X less than Y is false. And false and anything is false. So that first part of the formula is false. And similarly, y less than x is false. So 
the second part of the formula is false and false or false equals false. So this formula equals false when X equals Y, which means no change is possible. So the algorithm must stop. So this is Euclid's algorithm in math. Just two simple math formulas. OK, let me write it in TLA plus. What we do in TLA plus is we just give those two formula name formulas names. And initial the initial part is typically usually called init. So I write this init and this funny equal delta symbol it just means is defined to equal. So we say init is defined to equal this formula X equals M and Y equals N. And the how X and Y can change form formula is usually called next. So this is Euclid's algorithm in TLA plus. Uh, that's actually the pretty printed version. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is what you actually type in ASCII. Uh, looks very much the same. And you know, once you get used to it, most people, most programmers don't like looking at the uh, pretty printed one. They just look, use, look at the uh, ASCII part. So that's it. But what about more complicated algorithms? They're described in exactly the same way, just with bigger formulas. Well, how do we handle big formulas? By the simplest and most possible powerful way of handling complexity that has ever been invented, the definition. We can break a big formula into smaller, simpler formulas. Even this simple formula, we can break into two still, still simpler formulas by giving names to these two parts. Uh, I'll call them decrement Y and decrement X. And then we define the bigger formula in terms of them. Next is just decrement X or decrement Y. Now, I've told you that this is the complete description of Euclid's algorithm, but I lied. These formulas actually say what the algorithm is allowed to do. Uh, that's called safety. They don't say what it must do. Uh, they allow it, in fact, to stop at any time. This seems weird to people, but there's a good reason for it. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, if we don't want it to stop, we also have to say not what it may do, but what it must do. And that's called liveness. So we need another formula to say what the algorithm must do. Uh, it must keep going while X is not equal to Y. And an equivalent way to say that is X and or Y must keep changing while next allows it. Uh, and that's written by this funny formula. Uh, don't worry about what that formula means. Uh, with, uh, just to show you how simple it is. And this is the de complete description of Euclid's algorithm. Now, I think this is really cool. You may not agree, but uh, it is very useful. Uh, by the way, liveness for absolutely every sequential algorithm is written you know, with this WF formula, just instead of XY, you know, other variables. Uh, but liveness requirements for concurrent algorithms can be more complicated. And in fact, programming languages say nothing about liveness. If you look at this 381 page book about Java, I'm willing to bet that it does not mention liveness. It doesn't say what the algorithm really does do, except implicitly you sort of think that, well, it's supposed to keep going. But uh, now there are other languages that do a pretty good job of specifying safety, but none of them compares with TLA plus for specifying liveness. TLA plus is simpler and more expressive. Now, safety and liveness are standard concepts. And in fact, I introduced them back in olden days. So I know what I'm talking about when I say that TLA plus is better than anything else I've ever seen for describing liveness. OK, so that's the complete specification. What does it look like? You know, how big are these formulas? Well, the initial part, and it is usually less than 10 lines. Liveness may be zero. Lots of people times people don't bother specifying liveness because they don't they don't think it's a, a problem or usually you know, a few lines. 
And next can be up to 2,000 lines. That's about the limit because that's the largest spec you, know, you can wrap your mind around. Uh, it's generally split into smaller definitions. It's not always split into smaller definitions. And it's usually a it total is less than a thousand lines, at least in the specs that are written in uh, Microsoft. So all the action, everything is really in the next part. Uh, and that's just, remember, just a simple formula, except it has primes and unprimed variables. Oh, and then there's one more line. This single formula is actually combines everything into, a, into one mathematical formula. Uh, it just packages this whole specification. It's mathematically elegant and really great for some things, but for system designers, it's just this one line of boilerplate they have to write and they don't worry about really what it means. So that's it. What about distributed algorithms? Now, I've worked on distributed algorithms since 1977, and I've described Paxos in lots of ways. And there's no better way to precisely describe a distributed algorithm than using math in this way. Okay, what about checking a specification? Uh, well, checking a specification uh, leads to what, uh, you know, my take on, on this statement, which that a tool is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your math is. You know, you can make mistakes in writing math just like you can make mistakes writing anything. And you need tools to check your math. Now, the main tools that TLA Plus provides are the, TLA, the TLC model checker, which checks all executions of a small instance of a big system. For example, uh, you might be checking a memory system, which is designed for you know 64 processors and you know gazillions of megabytes of uh, memory. But what you'll do is you'll check all possible executions of the system with three processors maybe and two memory registers. And it's hard to believe until you try it, but it's very effective at catching bugs and much, much better than random testing. And engineering experience tells you how much confidence this instance that you're testing gives you in the correctness of the algorithm with 64 uh, processors and lots of memory. Uh, you want to use as large a model as you can, but checking time grows exponentially with the size of the model. And model checking is, model checker is easy to use. There's also a proof checker. Now, a machine check proof is the greatest confidence in your system, but that's really a lot of work. And is it too hard for most engineers? I hope not. Uh, we're trying to make uh, TLAPS easy enough to use that, you know, you don't need to be a PhD mathematician. An engineer should be able to do it. But uh, no matter how successful we are going to be, it's going to still be a lot of work and it's very seldom going to be worthwhile for the systems that Microsoft builds. Now the toolbox, that's an IDE for writing specs and running tools on them. There are Eclipse and Visual Studio Code versions. Now the Visual Studio Code version doesn't have all features, so if you can deal with Eclipse, I, uh, you know, with something written in Eclipse, uh, I recommend using that, but a lot of people like to prefer the Visual Studio Code method. Okay, and now for something completely different, a view from the trenches. Take it away, Marcus. Okay, I will start sharing, and I hope everybody can see my screen. I can see my screen. So welcome. Uh, thanks, Essie, for handing over. Once again, I'm Marcus, and I'm <clears throat> an engineer working on TLA+. And today I'm going to show you how I use TLA Plus to rescue a failing attempt to make the TLA Plus tools better. Leslie talked about um, greenfield projects, right? Early on, Xbox and the Rosetta mission. Um, very successful spec-driven development process where they 
design a new factory on a green field. And one of which is this metric that reduced code size, or they reduced code size by an order of magnitude, which is perhaps the best way to avoid bugs, right? And we engineers also have to deal with legacy systems, legacy code, where we exchange this wheel here and this old factory for a better wheel, right? Or to make it a little bit more concrete, as I promised, uh, I was about to make TLC better because it was hitting the scalability wall on modern machines. And even though the underlying uh, model checking algorithm is then embarrassingly parallelizable for safety checking, this 20 years old TLC code base wouldn't really benefit from more and more cores. So I took a profiler, looked at the code, and I found that one of TLC's building blocks, which I today will call um, data store, was kind of a bottleneck. And unfortunately, I couldn't simply swap out this old data store for an open source, state of the art, modern solution, because the generic ones all were slower, which is kind of a testament to how well TLC was architectured, written, and it was just scaling enough. So I know that I have to come up with my own solution to make TLC better to replace this data store. And implementing something yourself always has the risk of introducing bugs, right? Here we can cause regressions, and in this particular case, I could have caused the worst category of bugs for a model checker, namely to miss correctness violations. And on top of that, there was no documentation except for a handful of comments written by the original authors. They had long moved on to other jobs, and they left no tests whatsoever. <clears throat> so in other words, the typical software modernization project, if you will. So it seemed safest to simply do a chicken little incremental rewrite where I reverse engineer the existing functionality and then at the code level swap out the old parts for something new without TLA plus because I figured, ah yeah, this, this is just code, this is easy, I don't need something fancy like TLA plus. And over the next few slides, I give you the account of how this fared without TLA plus also in the hopes of giving you a sense of the complexities that were involved. I will use a little bit of technical terminology here. Um, if you don't know a term, simply replace it for this takes at least one week or so of work. So let's get started. Here's my task board, and from profiling TLC, I know that there was a side threat contention that caused the bottleneck, which was because an in-memory data, in-memory hash set was guarded by this global lock. Uh, clear, high contention, low scalability. But I always immediately, also immediately noticed that there is a second bottleneck in the waiting, not yet a smoking gun, but soon it was in the area of when data was written from this in-memory part to disk. But I decided that's not important right now. I will think about this later. Let's look at the high threat contention. And fortunately, I know about this, knew about this concept called lock striping. That if you have one global lock guarding your data, and you can partition your data into n partitions, then you can n locks and get away without really reasoning about the correctness. And again, because the correctness argument for the global lock kind of carries over to the n locks, right? So it got implemented and scalability went up compared to the baseline. I was satisfied. Next, I addressed poor memory utilization, <clears throat> which was related to the problem that moving data from memory to disk required first moving it to a temporary location, sorting it, and then sending it to the disk. That I wanted to solve was in-place sorting. And also there was a lot of metadata overhead in the way how the data was organized in memory, which caused garbage collection, extra cycles, and so on. Fortunately, I came up with this other collision resolution strategy in this hash table, and that solved these two problems, produce in-place sort, and everything was great. I now decided it's time to really make this code fast, right? So throw all my programming techniques and foo at it, uh, tight loops, watch false sharing by reordering fields and class file definitions and so on to really drive um, coherence down and make things super fast. And it gave me like 10, 5 or 10% improvement, but unfortunately 
on the algorithmic level, I realized that I had introduced this issue by changing the way how data is organized, that the load factor in this hash table wasn't um, as given in the, in the textbook or substandard, which I ultimately attributed to non-uniform collision probability that I had introduced with my ad hoc changes at the code level. But engineering is not necessarily about elegance, right? It's about getting things done. So I came up with this workaround that made the collision probability appear uniform from the outside and that way improve the load factor, and it worked. Unfortunately, everything combined here, except for the code level optimizations, kind of led to negative scalability. So adding more resources to the system made the system slower. Bummer. Essentially, I was back at square one. The project had almost failed. So in retrospect, what were the issues here with my attempt? Perhaps I could have claimed, ah, yeah, this was just too complex. Could have, should have divided and conquered more little steps, more validation. But I think ultimately the problems were different. The real issues were threefold. First of all, I had this lack of abstraction. I was thinking at the code level. I tried to throw better coding at the problem. And whenever I had an algorithmic insight, I had to implement it in code. And then immediately programming blurred my vision, right? Then I had to think about fault sharing and stuff like that. That's why we usually design algorithms at the whiteboard. Whiteboards are beautiful, very elegant. You use pseudo code and all these problems of programming languages just disappear. But unfortunately, whiteboards don't, don't have tools to validate our thinking. Now, this is what Leslie earlier mentioned, the tools. We need some tool that validates that our algorithm on the whiteboard satisfies its correctness requirements. And lastly, my agile process here kind of lacked a spec, lacked a real plan. I wasn't really, didn't really know where to go. I had this um, ultimate goal, but there was no path to it. And a civil engineer won't write, build a skyscraper without a blueprint, without a plan that describes the way from start to end. And not just there's supposed to be a skyscraper in the end, right? And usually we, we engineers don't have this. So that's where I rebooted the system. I decided, OK, I, now I'm going to use TLA plus as my blueprint and use the tools as a, as a whiteboard that is also make sure that it's correct. So I will show you the specification now. This is it. It has, like Leslie says, the usual size of a thousand or so lines um, of TLA plus or Pascal, which is a dialect that looks more imperative. It's easier translated into code. Most of this here is um, our comments. It's unfortunately still too large to really go over it and show you all the details. What I want to show you today is <clears throat> that this specification that models this whole data store, the in-memory part, the disk part, and a concurrent uh, log-free um, concurrent writer protocol. That's uh, what I, that I, what I current previously didn't tackle because it seemed so, so complicated. This is all part of the specification, and it gets away with five global variables that are very abstract. So I have a sequence that's the um, in-memory data store, and I have a sequence that models the disk. The disk part is left a little bit more abstract, and the in-memory part is very detailed because I needed it to specify this log-free algorithm, right? Um, but things like exception handling, opening files, closing files, or the programming, that just simply disappears in the TLA plus spec. So it's kind of like the whiteboard, this part up here. And then at the bottom of the spec, I have a number of correctness properties that the um, TLA plus tools can verify if this spec here actually satisfies these properties. And this is what I'm going to do now. So I use TLC to check if this algorithm that I want to implement in TLC actually satisfies its properties. And TLC takes a couple of seconds, as Leslie says, and this can take time. Um, here it takes a few seconds to check some hundred thousand states, distinct states, which translates into many behaviors, many executions. With testing, we usually test one execution and then we rerun the test in hopes that it covers more execution. 
Here, TLC exhaustively and systematically explores all executions that are allowed or defined by the specification and allowed by the model. <clears throat> you will also see that there is um, an error here that TLC found, which is kind of like a test failure, right? So this spec that I wrote doesn't satisfy its um, correctness requirements. And with testing, you, you would usually get a check trace and then depending on the granularity of your logging, you might or might not have all the necessary data to really understand what goes on. With TLC, um, you get an error trace, which is a behavior that violates your correctness property from start to the initial state, all in between states and the final state where things crash or a loop um, if it's a violation of a lifeless property. And it captures the value of all the variables so you have all the data that you need to really understand what went wrong at the algorithmic level. And this was super useful to really debug this um, log-free protocol. <clears throat> In this particular case, the trace is 60 states or so long. That's a little bit difficult for a human to understand without additional tooling that exists in the toolbox. So we have tooling on top of it with which you can debug an error trace to really get the inside of what went wrong. But yeah, let's not see how this translates back into my ultimate goal to make TLC, the model checker, scale better. So for comparison, this is the scalability plot um, at the end of the initial approach with just better. On the x-axis, we have the number of processes. On the y-axis, we have the speed up. And things go up initially, so there is a speed up. But then, as I said, it flattened out and at some point was even negatively scaling. More, more resources, less results. Um, this is what I got out by better thinking, by leaving the code level and really thinking about the algorithm, being more ambitious about the algorithm, coming up with a log-free protocol and many additional algorithmic insights that made this thing scale almost linearly. At the top, I think we see the artifact of hyperthreading because this was the size of a machine I was using. So we have almost linear scalability and an order of magnitude speed up the previous work. So it seems TLA plus gives you an order of magnitude of something in some, some dimension. But how does this tra translate into quality, right? Leslie talked a lot about quality, what Satya said, how many bucks have come up with this code that was high risk. It's also notoriously difficult if you design a log-free algorithm. Well, I wouldn't have this slide if the answer wouldn't be zero. I'm obviously very proud of this zero here. Since this chip shipped a couple of years ago, there wasn't a single problem with this code. It just worked and I've never looked at it again, which is kind of cool. There's still this footnote here that says, <clears throat> in prior to the release, there was an issue with the code. And this now um, opens up the discussion of, ultimately it's the code stupid, right? We can't ship the specification, we have to implement the specification. And this is usually what people uh, wonder about when they hear about TLA+. In my particular case, I can tell you how the story, how the story went. I translated almost all the assertions and invariants from the, code, from the high level spec into code. So if you would look at the implementation of this data store, the ratio of code to assertions is a lot higher than usual, usual code. And then I ran scalability tests, large scale scalability tests. I didn't even bother to write unit tests, or functional tests. I was just in, in, um, interested in scalability. And after hours and hours of running scalability tests on a 100 plus machine, core machine, there was this flaky test or flaky bug that would show up. And I, I think most of the test suites we know or we have have these flaky bugs that only appear once a month or so and everybody writes off as a cosmic ray hitting our memory banks. Nobody bothers to look into it. But I had these assertions and they kept me honest. So I spent days and days fixing bugs in auxiliary code, code that wasn't specified, that wasn't modeled. And I found a dozen or so serious bugs that I fixed but none really explained the issue with this flaky test. That's where I really scratched my head and, and my, questioned my thinking. 
and went back to actually look at the code and the spec. And then suddenly I realized, oh, I simply made this stupid omission. I simply forgot to translate this else branch from the high level spec to the low level implementation. Probably some phone call interrupted me. But important is that this is an easy omission that could have been detected by a second pair of eyes, right? By a simple um, code read. This wasn't really difficult. And that's overall my observation is that if you have a high level spec and you implement it, you might make mistakes, but your quote quality gates can catch this. And if they catch it, you know that the bugs will be trivial. It won't be bugs that force you to go back to the whiteboard and redesign this whole thing from scratch. Okay, to wrap up, in summary, from my perspective, for me personally, TLA Plus is pretty much the most valuable tool in my engineering tool bag. It allows me to think at a much more abstract level to get things done. I've used it many more times in larger projects or larger to write larger specifications and also to write small specifications. Sometimes I thought I wouldn't need a specification for this particular problem. They've always paid off. There have been times where I decided I don't need a specification, and in hindsight, I realized I should have written one. Okay, if you got this, if this is curious, if you're curious now and want to learn TLA Plus, we have a TLA Plus study group um, at ACRMS TLA SG study group. And with that, back to you, Leslie. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, oh, I've got to choose this. Go here. Hit this. Say goodbye to Marcus. And we're in business. Okay. What do we check about a spec? Invariance. These are assertions about the state that should always be true. For example, one process cannot think that a command has committed when another thinks that it has aborted. Uh, we could also check that a spec implements a higher level spec. Uh, and that higher level spec is written exactly the same way as the lower level spec, you know, with init, next, and liveness formulas. Uh, so that can describe behavioral properties more complicated than simple invariants. For example, every message that's received is sent. Now, this isn't done too often by engineers still. Engineers usually check mostly invariants, uh, but they're doing it more and more, uh, checking higher level specs. Now, engineers, can, for the far the safety part of the spec goes, engineers can learn to read TLA plus specs in about a half an hour. Now, if you write a TLA plus spec and you want to show it to another engineer, it'll take you about a half hour to get him up to speed uh, for uh, being able to read the, uh, the spec. Learning to write TLA plus spec, well, Amazon people said that they could write useful specs in two to three weeks. Often those two to three weeks were spent learning uh, TLA plus in their The people at Intel said they felt comfortable writing specs after about a month. Uh, and they said it was just like any new, you know, like a new programming language. Uh, this is not rocket science. Specifying liveness, now for distributed systems, that's much more subtle in termination. Uh, for example, if an unacknowledged message is repeatedly resent, then it is eventually delivered. These things are uh, easy to express, uh, and the best way to do it is with temporal logic. And in fact, the TL and TLA stands for temporal logic. Uh, but uh, that's uh, some you know, people can have difficulty with that because liveness is a very subtle, uh, but subtle thing, and people can get their 
had difficulty getting their heads wrapped around it. But the difficulty is not due to TLA. It's due to the subtlety of liveness. And, you know, engineers are simply not used to checking it. OK, what you can check with TLA plus average time, average space required, the probability that something will happen. You can only check properties that are true or false of an individual behavior and probability and averages are things that are talking about, you know, properties of a whole set of behaviors. Well, you can't check them yet. Uh, there's work being done on that uh, that I don't uh, have time to talk about, but this is still at the you know, research stage. Stay tuned. Now you can't check what you don't model. A spec is an abstract model of a system and it can't prevent errors in parts of the system that it doesn't describe. Also, checking a spec won't find coding errors. And as Marcus has uh, explained, you still have to test the code, uh, but the spec gives you something to test for. Uh, one of the in early days and one of the biggest fans of, of uh, specification in Microsoft were the testers because the spec told them what the, what the the program they were testing was supposed to do. And in fact, as, Mar as Marcus indicated, each part of the code implements a corresponding part of the spec. And should be able to, uh, it's possible to in instrument code to check that it actually implements the spec. But yeah, that's something I won't talk about. So when is the specification written? Well, after a system is deployed, that's what it usually when specs used to be written. So expl spec explains what the system does so you can find what's causing errors in your system and understand how it should be used and helps you re-implement it if uh, you decide that it's hopeless to, to try to just debug it. And this used to be when most specs were written. Uh, better is implementing the spec while the system is being implemented, is writing the spec while the system is being implemented. Uh, and that will help to fi find design and algorithm errors. And better late than never. I guess that's what uh, Marcus was doing when he finally decided to stop and, and go back and uh, write a TLA plus spec. Uh, the best way is to write the spec, as Marcus indicated, before any code is written. That's when you should write it. That's when it's much, 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 much cheaper to fix the errors than when you've got a whole pile of code that needs to be changed. But the most important reason is that's when it has the biggest impact on quality. Improving the quality of software requires thinking, clear, precise thinking, not wishful thinking. Most tools that you'll find try to help you code not to help you think. They're supposed to find bugs without making you think. I mean, their goal is uh, the programmer, you know, writes a bunch of code without thinking. Then she pushes a button and the tools fix all the bugs. Well, that's not going to create software we can be proud of. And the only code that can't introduce bugs is the code that's not written. And you eliminate code by coding. Remember, the TLA plus abstraction is what reduced this code size. In 2004, Brennan Batson, who was then at Intel, said, the next big frontier in computer engineering is algorithmic complexity. In order to tackle this increasingly complex world, we need tools and languages which augment human thought, not supplant it. TLA plus is a language which connects engineers to the underlying mathematics of their design, providing insight which they otherwise wouldn't have. Now, the only thing that we should change in this, what Brian Brandon wrote, is that it's no longer the next, but it's big frontier. It's the current big frontier. Most Microsoft engineers need to think in terms of high level algorithms. 
or models or specifications, all different names for the same thing. It's a necessary step in building systems we can be proud of. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. <laughs>